In this course, we will examine the soteriological foundations of Christian dogma. The class will explore divine revelation, the mystery of the triune God, creation and man, the person of Christ, the Holy Spirit, the nature and mission of the church, the, the church's eschatological dimension, and the church's ethos as it encounters our civilization and relates its doctrinal beliefs to the world. Now, this is quite a packed description, but I want you to notice first the two key words in the first sentence. The first, the first is soteriological foundations, and I take this term to refer more to not so much foundations as though we're building upon it, but foundations in terms of a teleological aspect. Uh, the reason is we're doing dogmatic theology. We're, we're taking this introdu introductory course in, dog in dogmatics for the sake of understanding what God is doing for the sake of our salvation. And it is by means of dogmatic theology that we come to know what God is doing in, in the economy of salvation. So the question of the foundation, the soteriological foundation of, of our course, exploring and analyzing and dealing with uh, dogmatics on an introductory level is ultimately a question of, or, or at least an emphasis on answering the two questions, two basic questions. What is God doing and why is God doing? And um, in my opinion, in answering either of those questions, the other question, the other, the other, the counterpart to, 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 to that question is also implicated. And at least we, we arrive at the beginnings of an understanding of, of the other side of the equation. So if we, if we take the first question, what is God doing? Well, more specifically, since this is an introductory course to Christian dogmatics, what is God doing in Christ? And basically we, we can add, we can, we can answer that in Christ, God is communicating himself via the hypostatic union. Now, uh, don't get me wrong, um, um, the hypostatic union itself is not, is not a communication, but rather uh, a personal termination, uh, commonly referred to as the assumption or the taking on of a nature so that that nature for its hypostasis its, its independent existence is, uh, is, is terminating in a person. Now, with respect to a divine person, um, as with any person, but especially, and in spades, a divine person cannot be communicated. And so in that sense, the communication is not in virtue, not in virtue of the hypostatic union itself, but there is a true substantial union, a, a mysterious union between the assumed human nature of Christ and his divine personhood, which would also imply um, a divine nature. So what God is doing in Christ is uni uniting in a single person divinity and creation in a, the middle person of the Trinity, the, 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 in the words of Bonaventure, we might say, the mediating person of the Trinity, and we'll find, find allusions to this also in uh, St. John Damascene's De Fide Orthodoxa, which is one of the primary texts we will, we will use, and also um, in the assumed nature, in the mediating nature of humanity itself. Um, because human nature, as you know, is, oh, is, is both spiritual and, and material, such that as spiritual it is, it is fully personal, but as material, um, it's impersonal and operates according to a set of laws or, or natural dispositions and desires. And, and in, in the composite human nature of, of, of soul and body, we see that two extremes are being brought together in one concrete kind of entity. So there's in Christ, we see that God is creating the perfect mediator. Um, the middle person of the person of the Trinity is assumed a mediating and middle nature 
um, that is created. And so what God is doing in Christ is, one, he's establishing perfect ontological mediation on a natural level that devolves upon a, a relation of persons. Um, in Christ, the, hum, the assumed human nature is being brought up into the love life, the life of the Trinity. Now, this assumed human nature has a mediating function. Um, it, A, establishes an ontological mediation between God and creation, and B, it functions as a sacramental, which doesn't exclude ontological by any means, but a sacramental moral kind of mediation, such that with Christ as the, as the perfect ontological mediator, he is also the perfect spiritual or, or, or moral mediator, such that he can, A, be the first instance of perfectly divinized human nature, and B, be the ground or, or, or cause of the divinization of all other human natures, with the key difference being that all other human natures terminate in human persons and are in no way divine persons, wherein, whereas in Christ, our humanity uh, terminates in a divine person such that, that even in his humanity he can no longer be rightly called a creature, even if his created humanity is created and finite. And so what we can see, what we, if we ask what God is doing, he is uniting and ordering all things to himself in and through the person and person of Jesus Christ, who is one person, one divine person in two natures uncreate and create, infinite and finite. And so we have on the grounds of the answer to what Christ is doing, we can speak to why he's doing it. Well, what is the incarnation? It's the assumption of a human nature to a divine person such that that human nature, that rational nature, terminates not in an individual finite person, but it terminates in a divine person. And in terminating and terminating in a divine person, it posits in that created humanity a dignity which is, which is beyond all human reckoning apart from God revealing that this is his ultimate purpose in creating. And so what we find is the greatness of God's work. But the greatness of God's work is oriented towards human nature being caught up and divinized in becoming a likeness to God's perfection. And because this perfection is ultimately uh, an order of persons and motivated by, per by personal um, goals and ends, it's ultimately a relation that is predicated upon goodness. And the foundation of the hypostatic union is God's goodness. It's a pure act of grace. It's the only unmerited grace that we experience or that we know of because the assumption of the human nature by the second person of the Trinity was in no way merited. Whereas all other grace, all other sacramental grace, all other ecclesial, uh, the grace of the ecclesial life, um, all, um, all of that is in and because of Christ and his mediatory work. So, the incarnation itself is founded upon the, the, the unstinting goodness of God. And this goodness of God, which is in God, is infinite goodness. And, be, and because God is also a person, this infinite goodness is loved in itself with a love of perfection, an infinite love of perfection that is absolutely ordered and perfect. And so in the incarnation, we see that it is founded upon purely the goodness of God, motivated and carried out in terms of God's love. So why, why, what did God do in Christ? He acted in the most loving way. And in Christ, we find what is most lovable. And a next point that we should uh, quickly note here, note here is that when we speak of Christ, 
we speak of all aspects of Christ, his divine person, which implies, as is defined in the Council of Chalcedon, he has a divine nature, but also, as a, as a person, he has assumed a human nature. And in this human nature, he has taken up and associated himself in his incarnation, and also, and especially in his resurrection and glorious ascension, he has assumed and, impl and implicated all the rest of humanity in himself and himself in humanity. And in, 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 in a real sense, that, then, that uh, we can speak of Christ as a new creation that presupposes and builds upon God's first creation, creation in Adam, but perfects it and draws it up into, perfects that first creation and draws it up into a mode of, of life and existence that infinitely exceeds what our wildest imagination about, about human perfection could be. The fact of the incarnation reveals the perfection of God's plan in Christ, and that perfection includes all the rest of humanity. All the rest of humanity is called up to become a member of the body of Christ in our persons and in, in our moral lives, bringing forth Christ and being witnesses and ices and icons of Christ in humanity on the one hand, but that transformation itself is by the working of the Spirit, that same Spirit which filled the human nature of Christ, the man Jesus, with all the fullness of grace. And because of, of the spiritual reality of the operation of, of, of the Spirit in Christ and that perfection, that same Spirit can be communicated in an unlimited manner to the rest of humankind within the context of his mystical, mystical body of Christ. And of course, in the Immaculate Theotokos, we see that, in fact, God has done this. On the one hand, as the realization of the, the virgin earth that God used to bring forth the man, Holy Mother Mary is already ground and prepared by the Holy Spirit to bring forth the God-man in his humanity. And thus she is in virtue of God's, God's foreknowledge of Christ's perfect humanity and obedience and his fullness of, of the Holy Spirit. That Holy Spirit is communicated to Mary from the moment of from the first moment of her existence, so that she can be a fitting vessel to bring forth the God-man on the one hand, but, al but also, and perhaps more importantly, and certainly is more importantly, that she is the perfect complement of Christ as this mediator of grace. She, in her person, is perfectly conformed, formed, to the will of God by the grace of the Holy Spirit, and thus, in her personal life and comportment, is another Christ. She's, in fact, another Christ to such a, such a degree that she brings forth the God-man. And then we must also include the, the mystical body of Christ and Mary's unique place in this. Mary is not only the Theotokos, the God-bearer, she is also the first and preeminent and unique member of the mystical body of Christ, as redeemed perfectly, requiring no purific purification from sin and liberation from the weakness of will and the blindness of mind that sin brings about, she is the most perfect and exemplary member of the Church as the most perfect work of Christ's perfect mediation and salvation on the one hand and on the other and on the other hand because of her unique relationship to Christ she also is a particularly active uniquely active member of the mystical body in bringing all the rest of Christ's brethren up to a point where with St Paul we can say say that Christ will present his church 
as an immaculate bride to the Father. And we also have an allusion to this in, um, I believe, Apocalypse chapter 20, where the new Jerusalem is descending from heaven, uh, perfect in order and in grace. And so when, when we speak of what God is doing in Christ, we're speaking of everything that Christ implies. It implies in the economy of salvation, the one order that, that God has established to communicate himself and his love outside of himself is primarily ordered towards Christ and his perfect humanity, Christ, Christ and his perfect instantiation of all the, the capacities and perfections of human nature as they can mirror and participate in the divine, and then as Christ communicates all this grace perfectly from the outset to, to the Theotokos, and then, and then through the process of purgation, illumination, brings us to a point of, of union in the mystical body of Christ. And this brings us then to um, an ultimate answer to why, why, why God is doing anything in Christ, in Christ. Why God is doing it is simply because of the goodness itself. And because God is infinite, his goodness is infinite. And whatever he does will be good. And whatever he does will be motivated by love. So what is God doing in Christ? He's acting in the most loving manner possible. And all of creation finds its meaning and importance in Christ and in his personal and cosmic aspects. So now to the, now to the question of, of dogma. What are we talking about when we talk about dogma? Well, in the dogma of the church, and we will, we will certainly run through, um, as we progress through this course in the next week or so, we'll run through the typical sources of dogma in the in the apostolic and Catholic and Catholic tradition, um, how to interpret dogma, um, how there's uh, an interrelationship and a hierarchy of dogmatic teachings. But, but for our purposes in this um, lecture, we can just simply say that dogma is the, the public proclamation of the teachings of Christ and the reflection upon Christ and his life and mission within the life of the church. And so what Christ commissioned to his apostles in the last chapter of Matthew, that they, they would, well, first of all, he states that all authority has been given to him in heaven and on earth. And as the Father sends him, so he sends the apostles to teach and instruct all men in whatsoever he has given them, and also to, to baptize. And so what we see, though, then, is to his apostles Christ commissioned the dogmatic kerygma, that, that evangelical gospel witness that refers to himself, the, the teaching, the intellectual aspects, but more importantly, importantly, in commanding them to baptize and to observe everything that he has commanded, he is situating the life of the teaching of the church within the ecclesial setting that is inclusive of apostolic succession, sacraments, the communion of saints. And so what dogmatics is, it's dogmatics is, it's dogmatics is the ordered and public proclamation of the teachings and life of the church already within the dynamic, spiritual, sacramental life of the church. And so, if we reflect back upon the, our question of the interrelationship between soteriology and dogma, and we ask, well, what is God doing in Christ and why? Well, God is establishing a communion of love in Christ and in his church as passed down by his apostles and apostles and their successors, namely the bishops and their helpers, the priests, for the sake of, of love. So why do we study Christian dogma in terms of its soteriological foundations? Because ultimately that's what dogma is about. It's about life in the spirit, life, life in Christ. And so dogma is 
is studied for the sake of this end. Thus, we, can, we might answer the question of why we study dogmatics, especially with reference to its soteriological foundation. Uh, in the terms of St. Bonaventure, um, we study dogma so that we may become good and principally that we may become good. And this goodness that we speak of is not merely a human ethical or moral goodness. It's not, it's not a perfection of intellect or, or moral activity. It's, it's, it's a perfection that makes us into a similitude of God. Um, it's a kind of perfection that is not so much um, <clears throat> considered according to an analysis of proportionality. It's actually a qualitative likeness and identity with God by in and through the stud, stud, study of dogma, seeking to integrate that dogmatic life into the broader liturgical and spiritual and prayer life of the Christian. So this goodness that we're seeking to strive is ultimately what, what we might call uh, be, uh, becoming a likeness of God in conforming to his will and taking on the characteristics of Jesus, the God-man's obedience to the Father and the Holy Theotokos' uh, obedience to the will of God. It's saying, God, you have revealed yourself in this way and I say, let, let your will be done in my life in accordance with what you've revealed and foreordained in your church and in the communion of saints. Having said a few words about the end and purpose of the study of dogmatic theology, that is so that we may become good and principally that we may become good. Uh, we can, we're in a position to say a, say a couple of words on the scope of the study of dogmatic theology. Generally, dogmatic theology is subdivided into two headings. Obviously, both of, the, both of these headings presuppose a knowledge of God as perfect being on the one hand as he's revealed himself in creation and in the human soul and in his own perfection, in the perfection of being that he is in himself. And on the other hand, it presupposes a knowledge of the incarnation because the Christian faith is grounded historically and epistemic in the fact of the Incarnation and what Christ reveals about the nature of person, personhood, divine and human. So uh, these two headings will, will then be properly God in himself, what the Church Fathers call theology. And following from the term theology, a word about God theology's object and essential subject of study is God in himself. That is, God as Trinity and God as perfect being. What the Church Fathers, especially St. John, Dam John Damascene, as well as uh, the medieval theologians, such as Bonaventure, call circumcision, that in existence or overlap of the three persons really distinct in the one being of God, that first being, who is one because three and three and three because one. And then the second heading is God in Christ and creation. Now we've already mentioned in, or previously in this lecture that in Christ, and in the economy of, economy of salvation, God has revealed his purposes for everything outside of himself. And this is generally categorized under the heading of 
what the fathers call the economy of salvation. And this refers to God's activity at extra. And so, primar so primarily, it will focus upon Christ in his hypostatic union to the, the person of the word, Christ as the man-God, one person in two natures. And this will also take into consideration the essential Marian mode of the economy of salvation, although by no means necessary that God should become incarnate through the woman. Nevertheless, he chose to make the woman, and thus, thus creation at its very peak of perfection, a cooperator with God and God the Son incarnate through the Holy Spirit, God, God was willing to make creation a synergistically activated and energized participant and cooperator with God in the redemption and salvation of mankind. And then this brings us to the third point, this redemption and salvation, this, this, this movement towards purification and deification comes in and through the Holy Spirit, situated within the context of the liturgical, sacramental, and doctrinal life of the Church. So, in general, anything that we might have to say about dogmatic theology will fit under one of the two main headings of God and Himself, theology proper, and God in Christ and creation, that is, God at extra, outside of Himself, in the economy of salvation. Although dogmatic theology is implicated and bound up with every other aspect of theological research and discussion, discussion it's, it's nevertheless useful to draw some distinctions between various modes of theology in order to better specify dogmatic theology as a discipline distinct from other areas of theology. And one might usefully distinguish within theology three ma basic modes, the first being symbolic or creedal, um, or theology based upon the reflection upon natural revelation. <clears throat> Excuse me, and what I, and what I mean by natural revelation is what God revealed about Himself in creation, and then a second or distinct mode of pursuing theology might be called theology proper, and that's what most people today consider theology. Theology done um, behind a desk in a university, or theology theology done for the sake of of reading and write, writing um, about theology with the learning of theological formulas and truths to the point that they seem detached from the, 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 the creedal profession of faith on the one hand, and then on the other hand, and this is with respect to the third mode of, of theology, a disconnection from contemplation. Ultimately, by contemplation, we mean the theology of prayer. Um, theology of what is what is known in faith and revealed in faith, passing into and being informed and perfected by charity. Um, so basically, when we speak of dogmatic theology, we will have all three of these modes in mind, but the emphasis truly will be on theology proper. However, not an understanding of theology that's divorced from the life of the church, and the life of prayer. So in some sense, our understanding of dogmatic theology in this course and the way we will approach the question of dogmatic theology will be one of seeing dogmatic theology based in the life of the church 
even if not always explicitly articulated, but, but understanding that theology is rooted in the creedal and liturgical and doctrinal expressions of the church that are common to all the faithful on the one hand. And then on the other, on the other hand, we will also see that dogmatic theology is between symbolic and contemplative theology, and ultimately, as Evagrius says, and he's just foreshadowing in certain ways and, and stating very explicitly and clearly what Bonaventure said when he said, theology is pursued in order that we may become good, when, he, when Evagrius states that the one who prays is a theologian, and a theologian is the one who prays. And really, this is the point of the symbols and the creed of pursuing academic theology in order that in order that we may become good and wise through contemplation of God's activities and energies outside of himself and in the worship of the super essential trinity and this is this is what ultimately the goal of dogmatic theology is theology is it's for contemplation of God in communion with all the saints and so we will do well to keep in mind this threefold distinction on the one hand, but then on the other, to not try to, by a process of exclusion, separate any aspect of theology, but, but see them all as a kind of inexistent unity in which theology is carried out in different modes and different emphases. Also, and finally, we should realize that theology is not pursued in a vacuum, and we will uh, touch upon this in a little bit greater detail in the following lecture. Um, but just suffice it to say that theology is in, in conversation with other humane and scientific disciplines. On the one hand, theology is dependent upon the data of history in order to understand the development of its own doctrine and teaching, uh, in order to understand the controversies that motivated and prompted the fathers of the church, church in council and in their own writings and prayer to clarify and, and distinguish what is orthodox and what is heresy. Um, uh, theology also presupposes philosophy in so much as it's really very difficult to, form, to formulate positive statements about God, even if those statements can only gesture and do not capture the fullness of what they're referring to, such as Trinity or divine person or even human person for that matter. Uh, but, uh, but we're still nevertheless dependent upon philosophical language in order to use the, 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 the datum given in the revelation handed to the church, we use philosophy in order to better understand that, that data. And then finally, finally also the other arts and sciences, uh, there are clearly implications with respect to metaphysics, a metaphysics that is grounded and rooted in the revelation of Christ and Christ as the purpose of God's activity outside of himself naturally even though we would never want to have theology, theology disguised as biology or physics, or even a form of literature, we would nevertheless say that because in the concrete order, Jesus Christ is the purpose and life in the mystical body is the purpose, the purpose of God's activity so that we may become good, so that we may become like God and deified. Any, any art, any pursuit that is truly human will need to take account of this and seek to understand the implications of this great fact in its own area of research and or artistic invention. Shifting gears a bit, let's move now to uh, the syllabus itself. And I won't, uh, I won't belabor what's on the syllabus, but allow you to uh, 
read it over for yourself. And uh, if there's any questions, please don't hesitate to email me at uh, the email pro provided um, at the top or at the beginning of the syllabus. But uh, please do take a look at the envisioned uh, learning outcomes um, that I'm hoping the students will come away from the class. Also, uh, the little bit more in-depth methodological overview that I've provided um, um, for the course. Um, and then, you know, look at, look at the assignments. Uh, note the due dates, how I expect uh, the participants in this class to engage the readings and the lectures, and then also how the grades are broken down uh, with respect to uh, discussion on on the the discussion boards. Half of the grade will be um, based upon that, and I give the details there um, under uh, the heading of uh, discussion board postings. And then take also a close look at the research assignments. Hopefully, the way that I've broken this down, um, it will be manageable to develop and research and write uh, a good paper. Um, for this class and have it pretty much ready to go by the time we get around to the final week of class, uh, which is week 14. And also note that research assignments are, will make up, will make up 50% of the grade. Um, and really that research assignments should be singular, the research assignment and then the component parts. Um, then briefly looking at the course schedule, this first week and this first lecture, we're going over the syllabus. Uh, giving some general ideas. Um, the second week, uh, we move into uh, the foundations, uh, biblical foundations, um, based upon what I take to be uh, bas uh, basically patristic and medieval understanding of metaphysics. That is, a metaphysics of typology topology and recapitulation. And this is rooted in especially uh, St. Irenaeus of Lyon, but also found again in people, figures like Maximus, and in the West, uh, St. Bonaventure. And so this will be how we approach the course. And, and this metaphysics of typology, topology will then undergird our approach to the study of the specific topics of uh, dogmatic theology. And so in what follows from week three through the end of the course, what I hope to do is, is move through the various topics of, of dogmatic theology, beginning with God and the Trinity, and then uh, week four, spend uh, an extra session of, of, of special dogmatics looking at the filioque, uh, because that is uh, a particular point of interest for Eastern Catholics being in communion with uh, the papacy and, and being um, in fidelity to the doctrinal pronouncements of the uh, magisterium in communion with with the papacy on the one hand, but also recognizing that there are uh, legitimate questions concerning the historical derivation and the meaning of the filioque. Of the filioque. And, and then, you know, in pursuing that discussion, we will uh, try to arrive at an ecumenical and irenic uh, conclusion to that question. And then week five, we move to the creation of the world, um, looking according to this typological metaphysics of recapitulation and um, the importance uh, and centrality of man in general, and specifically the God-man, Jesus Christ, um, for, the, for the order and understanding of creation. And so I've subheaded that uh, macrocosm for the microcosm. God created the, wor the world, the cosmos, for the little cosmos, mankind, and ultimately, mankind's perfection is found in the unique person of our Lord Jesus Christ, a divine person, and then Christ's created counterpart, a created person, Mary Immaculate, and then uh, the, li uh, the life of the church. And then week six, we'll move to a discussion of the fall. And it'll be an interesting discussion because there, again, is some areas of disagreement, though I don't think as weighty as some of these other areas that we will look into. Um, and so in week six, we will discuss um, the, fall, the fall of mankind and the effects of the fall and try to come to, again, uh, an ironic but yet dogmatically sound appreciation of, of that issue. Week seven, 
uh, we find the centerpiece of our course. If we begin with God um, and we end with God, well, the, the pivot point or the turning, turning point of the exitus, God's action ad extra, his action outside of himself, it finds its pivot point and term in the Incarnation, and especially the Incarnation in what we will call uh, its Marian mode. And thus the Incarnation presents on the one hand the term, term or perfection of God's created work outside of himself, but also the beginning point of the rest of humanity and creation's return to God in and through Christ and the Spirit. And then week nine, we'll look at uh, the operation, the, the what should we call, the, uh, the Holy, Holy Spirit-filled economy. Um, and we'll, we'll take a look at the way that the Holy Spirit operates in the lives of believers. And then uh, week 10, we'll park again a bit at one of the special topics, the issue of uh, the Polemite distinction, which has become dogmatic in the Eastern Orthodox, Orthodox churches, um, the Polemite distinction between the essence and energies, and look at, uh, since this is also my area of expertise and specialization, the uh, Franciscan uh, metaphysical tradition and account, and see if we can't provide a harmonizing read, read of the Polemite um, Eastern approach to the, the op operations of God, especially in and through Christ and his Holy Spirit, and the Western understanding of, of God's action in the economy of salvation in terms of the grace of the Holy Spirit. Week 11, um, we, um, we will then turn to a discussion of the church and the church as the concrete locus where we begin theological reflection. So there will be, there will be an, an emphasis on the sacramental and apostolic identity of the church as, as, it's, as it's mediated in and through its doxological mode of being, that is, its liturgical, sacramental way of living. And then week 12, naturally, uh, the sacraments as flowing from Christ and being practiced in the liturgical worship of the church. Um, week 12 will consider more carefully the number of the sacraments and their ordering in the relationship to the church and, and Christ's, um, the, the economy of salvation founded and rooted in Christ. Then finally, in uh, week 14, we will end in a sense where we began, only in this sense, we end with the eschatological hope of, of beatific life in God, in Christ, through the Holy Spirit for all eternity. And then finally, week 14, um, if, if we begin our course um, upon a soteriological foundation or basis, we end it with explaining why and looking more carefully at some specific texts from St. Maximilian, uh, excuse me, St. Maximus the Confessor, uh, St. Bonaventure, and St. Gregory Paulamas, uh, wherein they demonstrate that dogmatic theology is really so that we can become good, that we can become deified or divinized, and take on the quality of the love of God by conforming ourselves to the image of Christ in the unity of the Holy Spirit. And then finally, um, you can see uh, the required texts on page eight uh, are the basis of our text. Well, the basis of our, our exposition will be uh, John of Damascus, his De Fide Orthodoxa, and then also that will be, sub that will be sub supplemented by a modern dogmatic theologian, uh, the Metropolitan John Zizulas, a Greek Orthodox theologian who provides a very succinct and accessible summary of uh, Christian dogmatics, and then um, in the special sessions on especially, especially the Filioque, the Church, um, Mary's Immaculate Conception, we will be looking at the texts by uh, John Manusakis for the Unity of All, a very, very nice text just published uh, that is coming from an Orthodox perspective, but is very ironic and seeking unity, unity as the title suggests. And then uh, Paul McPartland's text, A Service of Love, having to do with uh, the place of the papacy in the economy of salvation and in
um, the context of all the apostolic churches, uh, meaning those churches that were founded and or derived from, from the apostles or their successors. And then you can look over the supplementary bibliography um, that follows, and then also keep in mind that each week will also contain um, supplementary bibliography as well that I've added in for, uh, for, uh, for your benefit and my benefit. So I hope those are helpful. So under each week, um, there will also be additional bibliography um, spelling out and specifying uh, further avenues of research. Um, then moving on to page uh, nine, you can look over the academic, the academic policies. And remember, if, if you have any question about policies, about assignments, um, about how to interact and engage with your classmates and, and me during uh, the discussion board opportunities, don't hesitate to email me. Um, I will try to reply as soon as possible. And so I hope this semester is good and goes very well. I'm very, I'm looking very much forward to this course and getting into these topics of dogmatic theology. And until next time.